Hello, and welcome to this edition of the CSIAC podcast series. This is a multi-part series entitled C++ Models, conducted by CSIAC subject matter expert Dr. James Fawcett. This series will explore different conceptual models underlying the C++ programming language. This particular podcast will discuss C++ templates and conclusions. Hello, welcome to the sixth and final uh, video in the sequence on C++ models. Uh, in this final video, we're going to uh, discuss templates, and then we'll draw some conclusions about uh, C++ models in general and show you where to find some resources. Okay, so templates. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, suppose that we have a point class that's templatized on a parameter t. In the last video, we showed you a point class that uh, used uh, double type for coordinates, but uh, we may need a more general type than that. So uh, uh, if we uh, templatize that class point, uh, with a template parameter t, where t is the type of the coordinates. <clears throat> so um, each coordinate could be, for example, an instance of a class that had some information about the coordinate and stuff, or whatever. Could be an int, could be a double, could be a, you know, float. So, <clears throat> so we have a, a template class point. Now, uh, templates are generated, code generators. The function template. Uh, uh, generates uh, uh, functions uh, instantiated for each of the types supplied to the template. So if I supply an int and a double, I get two functions, one using an int parameter and one using a double parameter. And the same, same thing for classes. <clears throat> Very often, the uh, uh, template operation is almost a substitution. Sometimes it's a lot more than that, but... Uh, We'll see that as we go along. So, uh, so they're function generators, and here I've shown a point class, templatized point class, and if I instantiate it for ints, I get a class point of int. And it has some objects that, you know, uh, you can create with that class. If I instantiate it for a double, I get a class point double, and you can instantiate that and get some points where uh, the, the coordinate in this case are doubles and the coordinates in this case are integers. And I, I can have both at once. And that, uh, what that means is that there's two classes and these are separate classes. Point int and point double are distinct classes. So for example, if I had a static data member in the templated point class, uh, the in class would have a static. Uh, the double would have a static, but uh, but the uh, static in the int class uh, shares its value with all instances of that class, but it doesn't share them with the point double. And similarly, the static in point double shares with all the the instances of the point double class, but it doesn't share them with point int. Okay, so so we have a code generator that uh, application code caused to generate two separate classes, and we can create points with those. All right, so here's an example of a template class. So this is a point class, and now we've, uh, we've uh, parameterized that with type T using templates. Otherwise, it's the same class. Now notice that where I had double here, I uh, substituted T, substituted T, I had a initialized a list of doubles uh, substituted with T, um, return double types, and here I'm returning T types. Um, here I had a vector of doubles, now I have a vector of Ts. Uh, so this is, for this class, is almost uh, totally just a substitution process. Uh, for some classes, again, it may be more than that, but a lot of classes, it's just basically a substitution class. And um, so each of the member types uh, have to be prefaced with this template type name T. So here's the constructor, one of the constructors for the point class. Uh, remember that any function with the same name as the class is a constructor for the class. 
And here I've said point of T, colon, colon, point, size of N, and the string name. So N describes the number of coordinates, uh, uh, and of type T, and string is just a name. Uh, notice that here I uh, specifically provided the uh, parameter in between angle brackets for this, and I didn't here. What's the difference? Here I'm using point as a type. Here I'm using point as a function name. So you provide this parameterization for types, not for function names. And uh, here I'm using a, you know, uh, an initialization sequence for name, and I'm reserving some coordinates, the n room for n coordinates with my uh, constructor. And here's a constructor for initializer list, and it just keeps pushing back the items. So I don't specify the n here. It's just I'm going to have the number of coordinates equal to however many things I have in my parameterized list, where the each item in the parameterized list is the value of some coordinate. <coughs> value of the data held in some coordinate <clears throat> and so on you know uh, uh, and I didn't you know there wasn't enough room I've alighted some of the methods but basically this is a nice example of a template class and some of the advantages of template classes now I get a, a lot of flexibility here because I can simply substitute different types for T but that's not the end of the flexibility story I can have an ordinary class that takes a um, uh, is a templated class that takes an argument where the argument is uh, a an implementation for some of its functions. So, for example, I might have a directory navigator uh, that's looking for directories and files. Uh, but we don't want to wire into that directory navigator what it does when it finds a directory and what it does when it finds a file. Um, we want that, that navigator class is really useful. We want to be able to apply it to any uh, application that needs it, needs navigation, without changing the navigator at all. And we can do that with templates. So we make the navigator templatize on a, on a uh, type name A, where A stands for the application. An A might provide a function do file and do dir that specifies what that application needs for files and directories. And uh, another application would uh, have a similarly uh, designed class that had do file and do dir that did the things that that application wanted. So we get a lot of flexibility by using templates. Okay, so. <clears throat> Uh, one more part of that story, which we won't uh, elaborate a whole bunch here, but uh, with templates, the generic uh, class or function uh, may operate well for a bunch of different types, but there may be one or two types that our application wants to use in which that generic processing doesn't work. So we'd like to be able to specialize for those cases the code uh, so that will work for those types. And for functions, we simply overload the function uh, with those specific types. And the language guarantees for a function, if I have a template function uh, and I've overloaded that for some specific type, if the application instantiates that parameter with that specific type that was overloaded, then uh, it will choose the overload. But if I don't have a match to the overload, then it just uses the generic. For any type that doesn't match an overload, it just uses the generic type. And that's very useful, very flexible. It extends the range of the operation of these templates. And the same thing with classes. Instead of overloading, now we're specializing what's called specialization of the template. But again, if we have a, a generic template that works for a lot of types, but there's a, one or two types it doesn't work well for, uh, we can provide a class, full class definition, that uses this, the explicit parameter, those explicit types in place of the templates, uh, in, in place of the template parameter, and the language guarantees that if the template type matches the specialization, 
it'll use the, it'll compile the specialization. If there's, uh, if the type doesn't match any specialization, then it'll compile the generic type. And again, this is just a nice way of extending the range of those template classes. So uh, there's uh, some subtleties associated, especially with the class specializations that we cover in some detail in the CPP story, but uh, here our intent is just to provide good mental models for the way the language goes about its business. So we'll, we'll reserve those details for uh, you to look at when you read through the C++ story. And again, we're gonna come to the conclusions in the next slide and we'll show you how to find that stuff. So, so C++ provides two great ways of supporting the development of flexible code. Uh, uh, inheritance and polymorphism allows us to add uh, new specialized derived classes um, that don't break um, existing code and templates uh, and uh, templates allow us to uh, provide uh, arguments that specify, uh, uh, that specify some uh, type we want to use, and if we want to instantiate it for a new type, we just created a widget type, and we want to instantiate it for widgets. Uh, that'll, um, you know, as, as long as everything else is syntactically a match, that works fine. So two great ways of writing flexible code. If you look at the C++ story, you'll see nice examples of both of those kinds of uh, building flexibility into code. Okay, so let's draw some conclusions. We're at the end of our C++ models, not the end of the C++ story, but the, this, remember these C++ models were just the first chapter in our C++ story. And uh, so we're gonna wind that up here. Uh, so, if you understand this, eight models we've uh, we've provided, uh, and uh, if you understand those eight models, especially the C++ object model, if you understand those, uh, you're going to find that the language syntax and semantics are consistent and sensible and fairly easy to understand and use. You know, um, the, uh, it isn't a uh, you know hard, complex, it's a big language, an ambitious language, but it isn't nearly as complex as it in some quarters has a reputation of being. It's very sensible and very regular. In some ways, it's more regular than some of the other languages that are uh, touted to be simpler. So some particular parts of the language are discussed in the CPP story, but not here. Uh, requires some fairly detailed study, template type deduction, function overload resolution, template type, template metaprogramming, all these things uh, get into some fairly sophisticated details. And again, we cover a lot of that in the C++ story, so you're invited to go take a look at that. And I'll show you where in just a second. Okay, but uh, you know, generally, template type deduction just works. You, you know, you don't need to understand these sophisticated details, every once in a while it doesn't, and you need to fall back and look at some of those, you know, what happened, why did it, why did that happen? But it's rare. Usually it works just the way you'd expect it to work. Uh, template metaprogramming traditionally has been quite complex and, and um, sophisticated, uh, kind of hard to use. But with each version of the language, uh, C++11, then C++14, and now especially C++17, template metaprogramming has gotten significantly easier to use. There's some very common things we want to use that are almost trivial to do uh, with the parts of C++17. And you'll see examples of that in the C++ story. We're not going to talk about them here, but <clears throat> uh, here's where you can find stuff. So the, web, uh, uh, the website is, uh, you know, jimfawcettgithub.io, and the C++ story starts with this. This is the first page of the C++ story. Now, these stories are linked collections of pages, and each page, you know, if you look at the top menu, you'll see a next and pre buttons, and if you click next, you'll go to the next in the sequence. Also, it responds to keyboard commands. If you hit N on the keyboard, it'll move to the next one. If you hit P on the 
keyboard, it'll move to the previous one. So uh, this is a link set of pages, and uh, there's also a lot of code examples um, for the story. The story is fairly detailed. There's a lot of code examples, and you'll find them in this uh, CPP story repository. And uh, this will take you directly to that repository, and you can download it and build the projects. One word of uh, note, uh, virtually all of this code has to be uh, has to be compiled with the C++ 17 standard option. By default, uh, Visual Studio, for example, doesn't use the C++. It uses uh, what I think is C++ 11 as the default standard, but uh, it's simple, one click. You go to the property sheet and you click to get the uh, C++ 17 option going, and then they'll all, should all compile. Everything there should compile. Uh, from this story, the first chapter are C++ models, and I've abstracted from that chapter these videos. So these videos represent in, in some detail what's in that first chapter. There's some stuff in the chapter that isn't in these, in the videos, just for space and time. Uh, the presentation slides on these models uh, you can find here in the website resources cppmodels.pdf. Pull that down. That's what we've been looking at in these videos. Are the uh, this set of PDFs, and uh, and uh, if you open the home page of the website, you'll see at the top a link to videos, and that will take you to all the videos. You know, the, there's a table with all these videos in it. You just click on them and start up the videos. So, and here's, uh, you know, here are uh, links. Here I showed you, uh, here, uh, but these aren't clickable links. Here are the clickable links uh, for that. So with that, we're gonna stop. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, doing these videos. I hope you've enjoyed them. Uh, if you have, you're, feel free to uh, send me comments. I have a Piazza uh, uh, account. Uh, just to take comments and uh, bug reports and stuff like that for this website. Uh, so um, you're welcome to do that. Uh, you know, look on Piazza for that. Uh, or, you know, if you have my email, you can send me an email. That, that works fine, too. Uh, with that, um, been a pleasure talking to you. And we will say uh, one last time, we'll say, Goodbye. On behalf of the CSIAC, we would like to thank you for viewing this podcast. We hope you found the content informative and useful. If you would like to provide feedback or comments, please visit our website at www.csiac.org, where you can also find additional content to review. Thank you. Did you know that CSIAC offers free monthly webinars featuring experts in the areas of cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management? Come see leading industry professionals talk about industry practices and leading research. Make sure to visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars in order to subscribe to our mailing list and see when the next webinar series is available. There you can also watch previous webinar series to catch up visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars.